Welcome. Thanks for tuning in today. So glad you have joined our Linden Road online experience here. And if this is your first time, we want to give a special welcome to you and say thanks for checking us out. And do us a favor by clicking on the digital connection card or leaving a comment in the chat. Or if you're watching us on YouTube, scroll to the bottom. And there's a link there to our digital connection card where we just love to connect with you. Leave us your email address and a name. And if there's a prayer request you might have or if, there, or if there's a question you'd like to have answered that we could attempt to do that. Thanks for being here and we certainly hope it's not your last time. And if this is your spiritual home, we say welcome to you and we invite you to use those same connection pieces, the digital connection card up above or leave a comment in the chat or scroll down to the bottom here on YouTube and just let us know. Uh, if there's something we can pray for or if there's something we need to know. Uh, but we are grateful that you are here. And as we gather today, we gather in a time that is continues to stretch all of us, right? As each day since last week has unfolded, uh, the terrible news that's come out of the Middle East, specifically what's going on in Israel and the Gaza Strip. And so we want to take some time this morning and go before the Lord in prayer. It's that understanding that we're reminded, as the prophet Isaiah said in chapter 2, verse 4, that God will judge the nations and he will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. That certainly is our prayer. And we know that this tension in the Middle East has been there for millennia. So it's going to take more than just simple effort to resolve what's going on there. And it just reminds us of our need for, for God. But this morning, let's take some time and let's pray specifically for three things that I'd like to outline for us. First, for the restoration of order and security throughout Israel and Gaza. And then second, for the leaders of Hamas to cease any further terrorist attacks on Israel. And then for the leaders of Israel to focus on defense of the Israeli people and not on revenge. And then finally, for the protection and safe return of all who are being held hostage. And so let's pray together now. God, we are grateful that you are in charge and we're reminded by the prophet's words of your desire for what would happen in the world. And we know that we're not there yet. And so we just pray these particular points this morning together, that you would be present in a way that bring about peace and that in all these things, you would be lifted up we are grateful for the promises that are sure that come to us through the scriptures and we pray those moments into all that's going on. And we just know that we're not in control in these moments and so we turn to you to give us strength and we pray it all through the strong name of Jesus. Amen. So we're in our third week of this particular series uh, called Created a Dream. It's our 40-day uh, spiritual growth campaign here. Uh, we've had a number of small groups that have engaged, and I know several of you have done this online, and so grateful uh, for your faithfulness in this. And, and as we come today to this third installment, we are reminded that it's all about faith, right? Now, the first week we stepped off, we talked about how we make faith to work for us and how we need to have faith in God and how that can change the way we see the world and see our circumstances. And then last week I gave you an acrostic, sort of five simple words that can help us start our journey and that that's part of it, that we have to take the first step. But today I want to talk about this idea of what do you do when God doesn't show up? What do you do when there are these delays in what you're expecting God to do? And it, I think for all of us, it becomes really frustrating. And I know the things I'm praying for and wanting to see breakthrough on. Uh, I know what others are looking at in terms of issues at work and issues in family relationships. And, and yet we know taking that step of faith, as we talked last week, is that sometimes all you can do is wait on God. And that's okay. That's part of the journey. Waiting when things aren't moving quite as fast as you want them to takes a lot more faith than going out and doing something impulsively. So we want to look at the book of James today. James is a, an amazing little book in the back of the New Testament. I'm always uh, wanting to encourage people as they come new to faith to start there. It's uh, written by the half-brother of Jesus. 
And James gives us so much wisdom, but in particular, I want to look at chapter 5 and verses 7 through 11. He says, be patient, my friends, until the Lord comes back. Remember how patient farmers are as they wait for their valuable crops to mature and ripen? They also wait patiently for the spring and the fall rains to do their work. You must, too, be patient. Don't give up, because the Lord could arrive at any time, and don't complain, especially against each other, or God will judge you. Remember that the real judge is standing at the door. Another example of patience in the face of suffering is God's prophets who spoke God's truth in hard times. Today, we honor them for their patient endurance when they suffered unjustly. Then remember the example of Job. Job continued to patiently trust God while enduring great pain. But we know how God fulfilled his purpose for Job and that his plan for Job ended in good because the Lord always treats us with tender compassion and merciful kindness. So I'm going to say, because I know just in my own story, that this thing of learning to wait, to wait patiently, is probably one of the most difficult lessons to learn in our life, especially as a Christian. Children and immature people have a difficult time in waiting, don't they? Now, it's all about, I want it now. I want it now. That's part of our cultural problems today is immediate gratification. And so it's interesting here that James shows us when and why and how to develop patience when things take longer than we think they should. And if we're quite honest, all of us have spent a lot of our lives simply waiting. And there are many, many things that have tested our patience, especially in these last number of years, right? Highways, going to the store, uh, going to the doctor's office, just dealing with the global pandemic and all the things that came out of that, the political process, the economic things that we're pushing through. And if we're honest, as human beings, the one thing we all hate together is to wait. I mean, think about just the simple thing of going to a restaurant. You actually have to wait five times before uh, you get out of there. First, you have to wait to be seated, and then you have to wait to get the menu, and then you have to wait to order, and then you have to wait for the meal to be served, and then you have to wait for the bill. And then what's interesting about all this, right, the person that is bringing you all these things is the guy named the waiter. But actually, you, know, you and I are the ones doing the waiting as we sit in those restaurants, right? It's kind of funny. But today, what I want us to do is I want us to look at a faith that waits patiently. It's interesting in this uh, scripture passage from James that six times he talks about the word patience or having perseverance. And so James is going to be our go-to source this morning for what are three examples. He points out the farmers, uh, the prophets, and then this man named Job who comes out of the Old Testament. And how all three of these can offer us some encouragement in our own faith journey. Now, what I want to do is look at this in three different ways. First is, when is waiting patiently an act of faith? And then, what do I need to remember while I am waiting? And then finally, how do I trust God when I'm waiting for something that's been delayed? Let's step off first with when we have to wait patiently as an act of faith. I mean, when is it an act of faith? Well, to be honest, it's we need patience all the time, right? But there are three times when patience is especially needed and especially important. And it has to do with what James pulls out of here, the farmers, the prophets, and Job. The first one, and it seems like this is the one that we really need to emphasize to begin with, is the foundation. We need to be patient when circumstances are uncontrollable. Now, truth is, that's a lot of our life, right? There's not a lot that we can control. Now, it's interesting here, James uses uh, the, the idea of a farmer as an example, and he says again here in verses 7 and 8, Be patient, my friends, until the Lord comes back. Remember how patient farmers are as they wait for their valuable crop to mature and ripen. And they also wait patiently for the spring and the fall rains to do their work. You too must be patient. Don't give up because the Lord could arrive at any time. And I know for many of us, right, especially in this season, it's like we know the Lord is coming. But the truth is, I don't think I can wait that long. And then he says what? He wants us to unpack this a little bit in our own story is to see that we look at the farmers and we realize what does the farmer do? Well, think about farming. I mean, farming requires a lot of patience. The crops don't come up overnight. It takes a whole season. 
Uh, you put something in the ground and then you wait and 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 you wait and, you wait and then the plant comes up and then you have to weed and you have to prune and then eventually after a whole lot of waiting you get to have the harvest and now think about this in the context of farming there's a lot of uncontrollable factors and i'll just list three you can't control the weather you can't control the economy and you can't control labor prices now all that takes faith if you're a farmer and even when we know something is uncontrollable we still want to try to control it right and how do we do that well how about this if you want to know if you're trying to control the uncontrollable you can ask yourself this question am i worrying about it because simply put to worry about something is to try to control it to worry about something you can change is dumb to worry about something that you can't change is useless right but the bible says that when we worry we actually are trying to control the uncontrollable and he says specifically about the farmer that he doesn't do that he simply waits and he trusts god in the things that he can't control and when the circumstances are uncontrollable we need patience amen <laughs> so the second point here we want to say is that when truth is unpopular and especially in our culture today because I think as we follow Jesus and we take stands, even coming up on the election process here in Ohio, we have two issues on the ballot, issue one and issue two. Issue one is about abortion. Issue two is about marijuana. And in both these things, there is a perspective that we as the church want to offer. And unfortunately, as we offer those things, it's going to cause some controversy because we're going to say some things that are truthful and people don't like to hear the truth. And when they deny it, when they don't want it, then it becomes unpopular. The only thing that people want to hear is what they want to hear. And they get upset when you speak truth to them. And that means that truth isn't always popular. And of course, today in our culture, we, we live in a world that believes a lot of lies about the world and about the way things turn. And even the controversy over this last week of what's taken place on college campuses about uh, understanding the Hamas and the tensions in Israel. And it's, it's very difficult to watch and see. And again, it points us to the fact that we need a savior, that these issues are deep and they're grounded in our sinful nature as human beings, and we need God to show up. So we need to see that in many times people believe lies about ourselves that aren't true. Again, looking here at James, he says in chapter five, verse 10, Another example of patience in the face of suffering is God's prophets who spoke God's truth in hard times. Today we honor them for their patient endurance when they suffered unjustly. And we know the major and the minor prophets, as you look at them in the Old Testament, they're declaring to the world the truth that God had for them was not without difficulty. And in some cases they lost their lives doing it. Now, what was it about the prophets? What was their duty? What was their calling? Well, they were called to confront people and tell them to change their ways, uh, to get them to return to God. And so the duty of the prophet is to get people to be different, to change their behavior. Now, the problem is for all of us is that uh, the, we resist this idea of change. And even when it's something that's good for us, none of us like change. And when you suggest change to somebody, there's often pushback. So the prophets had to deal with a lot of messiness, a lot of unpopular things that they had to say. And they weren't liked by a lot of people. Uh, prophets were often maligned and they were often misunderstood. And when you read the scriptures, we know they were criticized and they were often very unpopular. And we know that, that can be discouraging. So let me just say this, you probably don't want to be a prophet if you want to get along with people, if you want to be popular, because the job of the prophet was to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. I think it's just that simple. They would not only tell it like it is, but they would tell it like it should be, and they would also tell it like it could be. And so prophets, as a result, because truth isn't always popular, they had to be patient because people don't change quickly. Now, in the scriptures, in the New Testament, the Greek word for patience is this word markothumus. Do you see anything similar in that word, markothumus? Because it's interesting, we get the word thermometer from it. And what does a thermometer do? Well, it measures heat. And so what Marco Thumas means, it means patience is, 
it, it means that it takes a long time for you to get hot, right? That's what it's like. Patience is about having a long fuse. You don't get hot quickly. You don't snap and break. You don't blow up in the moment. You think about things and you, you walk in a season of quietness. You, you think about things and you don't get overheated uh, because people don't agree with you. And if you're going to be uh, successful with people, you've got to learn to be patient, right? If you want to be successful with people, then this core fundamental truth is you've got to be patient. If you're going to be a successful parent, you, know, you can't get overheated. You've got to learn processes on how to deal with the child. You have to have a long fuse. We're reminded from that great chapter on love in 1 Corinthians 13. It begins what? Love is patient. And that's the same word, Marco Thumas, that makes us understand that it takes a long time to get hot. And what does that mean? Well, it means that we don't grumble while we're waiting. And it means that uh, when we're going through things that we don't like and we're having to be patient and wait, and you may get a lot of delays to what's going on. Sometimes, as human beings, we're prone to start grumbling right away, but that's not what he wants us to do. Again, James says in chapter 5, verse 9, Don't grumble about each other, my brothers and sisters, or God will judge you. Remember the great judge is coming, and he's standing at the door. When do we need to be patient? When do we need that long-term waiting in faith? When circumstances are uncontrollable, and when the truth that you have to share is unpopular, we need to be patient with people. We need to just love them and be patient with them. But then there's this third point here today we want to look at, is that uh, when we need to be patient when pain is unbearable and unexplainable. We've said that circumstances are uncontrollable, and we also know that people are unchangeable. But when we have pain that's unbearable and unexplainable, that's when we need patience too. And the example that James pulls upon is this person, Job. And I, I'm sure you know the story. Job was the wealthiest man in the world. He was famous. He had everything he wanted. And on one single day, he lost it all. He, he lost all of his family due to war. He lost all of his crops to pestilence. He lost all of his livestock, and he got a terrible, painful, and terminal disease. It was just a mess for him. He literally lost everything in a day, according to the scriptures, and he didn't understand what was going on, really struggled with what was going on to process it, because there was no explanation. Job, we know, was a godly man. We know that he feared God. We know that he loved God. We know that he served God, and yet he literally lost everything in a day. And we know, too, that as it's presented to us, it's a test. And yet in this time when God was testing him or allowing Job to be tested in his faith, the evil one came along and said, your man, Job, the only reason he's serving you is because he's got it good. And God said to him, nope, you don't know Job. And he allowed Satan to take away all the things that were good in his life. And Job still served God. He was patient and he was trusting. Again, James says to us, Remember the example of Job. Job continued to patiently trust God while enduring great pain. But we know how God fulfilled his purpose for Job and that his plan for Job ended in good because the Lord always treats us with tender, compassion, and merciful kindness. James chapter 5, verse 11. And it's interesting, at the end of Job's life, the Bible tells us in the book of Job that God restored everything that he had, double. So when we look at Job's story, it reminds us that when we think we've got problems, it could be worse. And it's interesting that the only thing that he was left with was a wife who was nagging him. And she said, why don't you just curse God and die? Well, that's not much of a support system. The worst part in Job's life is there's no explanation for what he's experiencing. He's got no idea what's going on. He's just going, why me? And what's fascinating about this story is that for the 37 chapters that we read in the story of Job, God says absolutely nothing to him. He's absolutely silent. But in that silence, it's interesting that Job persevered. He hung in there. He refused to give up. He patiently waited on God. And he was the ultimate example of faith. Even at one point, he says, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. So we know, let me just say it, uh, when we think about our own story, that life isn't fair. There's been so many things that we've gone through. And in the poignant moment of we think about what happened last Saturday, just how evil presented itself. 
and we see the messiness of what that turns out and now the war and the conflict that has been birthed out of that. We see the violence and we've seen it in so many different ways in our culture and our, we've seen it through the pandemic and all the things that the pandemic spurred and then even the idea of politics and economics and all those things. And so we know, we have to say it clearly, like a prophet, that there's a lot of injustice in the world. And at the same time, we maybe can't bring explanation to it. And, and that's okay, because we know that that's the way the world turns. And it really is our sinful nature that brings about these things. So let's go back to this question. What should I remember while I'm waiting on God? Especially in these times when you're going through, and I'm going through, all sorts of problems and pains and pressures. What do you remember while you're waiting on God? Well, again, James gives us three things. There's three reminders that pop out. First of all, to be reminded that God is in control. We don't know what's happening in the world. We don't know how long any of this is going to last. But we do know this. God is in control. It's interesting, this short passage out of James, three times he tells us that God's in control. He says, the Lord is coming back. Now, it's interesting. He says, be patient, my friends, until the Lord comes back, James 5, 7. Be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near, James 5, 8. And then the next verse, don't complain because the judge is ready to come, James 5, 9. So why in this short passage does he remind us three times that the Lord is coming back? Well, it's simply to have this mindset that it's the ultimate proof that God's in control. In fact, I love saying it this way is that history, this idea of all that life is about, is actually God's story or his story. That we're not living in an age that is circular and that things repeat. There's not some kind of uh, weird circle of life going on here, that the world is linear, our timeline is linear, that history is moving to a climax. That again, history is his story and that everything is happening in his schedule. God has a plan. God has a purpose, and, it, and one day we know this much that Jesus is going to return. Now, we don't know when it's going to be, and what's interesting is the Bible talks more about Jesus' second coming than it did about his first. Think about that. There's more in the Bible about the second coming of Christ than there is about the first. And I think that's what James is trying to get us to see. He's making a point here. He's saying that although things may look messy and upside down and out of control, and what you're going through or what I'm going through may be unpopular and it may be painful. Nothing, nothing is beyond God's control. And so we're to be patient. So what is he saying? Well, he's saying that God's timing is perfect. He's never late, but he's never early. <laughs> and that God is in control. I'm always reminded in my conversations with Mark and Gabe on the radio as we, as we talk about the various things, Bible study or culture or whatever else, that God is going to show up when he's going to show up. And his timing is perfect. And it helps us understand and hang on to these ideas when life is messy that he's in control. It's interesting that one translation of the scripture, the Phillips version, says, rest your hearts on the ultimate certainty. I love that. Because what is ultimate certainty? Well, it's this, Jesus is going to come back one day and that nothing's going to stop that. And it will be exactly on time when he wants it to be. So we remember that God's in control. We remember that God also rewards patience. Again, James says to us, now we consider blessed those who have persevered. Highlight that one in the worship notes here and hang on to it, that we are considered blessed if we persevere. Now, there are all sorts of blessings in life. There are all kinds of rewards and when you are patient, it, what does it do? Well, it builds your character. I know we all wish there was an easier way, but that's the way this thing works. And so when you're patient, you avoid mistakes, right? And when you're patient, you're going to reach your goals. And when you're patient, you're going to be honored by others. And when you're patient, you're going to have happy relationships. There are all kinds of blessings and all kinds of benefits. In fact, it reminds us of this verse from Paul in Galatians 6, where he says, Let us not get tired of doing what is right. For after a while, in other words, it's a season, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't get discouraged and give up. That's verse 9. So there are these blessings that we all get. It comes to our character, and it happens in our life, and it happens in our family, and it happens in our faith community, our church. 
And by the way, we need to be reminded that these rewards just don't happen when you're patient. They're, they also, the Bible tells us that they're going to be rewards in heaven too. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount says, Blessed are you when men shall revile you or insult you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. So maybe let's look at it this way. When you get hurt by somebody else, one of the first things we want to do, the strongest desire is to retaliate, right? To get even, to settle the score, to get revenge. And we need to be reminded that when those things happen, that our actions need to be done in the spirit of Jesus Christ, that we don't want to give up our eternal reward for how we might retaliate or how we might respond when life gets messy. So we need to remember that God's in control. And we need to remember that when he is in control, that he's working and doing all these things in our life. Because we need to see here this third point then, this is not the end of the story. That the third thing we need to remember, and we get this from the story of Job, because we see very clearly it's not the end of the story, that God is still working out behind the scenes. James 5.11, we know how God fulfilled his purpose for Job and that his plan for Job ended in good because the Lord always treats us with tender compassion and merciful kindness. So in those moments when we're facing a delay in our life, we need to be reminded, as we've talked about before, that a delay is not a denial. There's a story told about a past century pastor by the name of Philip Brooks. And he was pacing around in his study one day and he was frustrated. And his wife said, what's wrong? And his response was, because I'm in a hurry and God isn't. I don't know about you, but you ever been that way? Because I think to say it this way, the most difficult room to sit in is God's waiting room when you're in a hurry and God isn't. And truthfully, in this world we live in right now, we're all in a hurry. We're all in a hurry to have all these things over. I don't know about you, but just watching the news over the last week, it's painful. And it's like, can we get on with something different? But knowing that this thing could be protracted for months, if not years. And that breaks my heart and should break yours too. And again, is why we want to pray that God would intervene quickly. But I also want us to know, as we look at this, that while we're waiting, God is working. Again, that song, Waymaker. Even when we don't see him, he's working. And I think those words are even more powerful now to be reminded. And so no matter what problem we may have in our life, that while we're waiting, that we need to be reassured that God is working on our problem. And most likely it's in ways we don't see. So how about the example that James gives us about the farmer? While he's waiting for his crops, he can't see what's taking place under the ground, but we know that God has provided the nutrients and the soil and and that eventually it's going to produce a fruit and we'll see things happen. And so we need to be reminded and to say to each other that while you're waiting, God is working and that we need to remember that this is not the end of the story. Again, that verse that we look to so many times, Jeremiah 29, 11, I know what I'm planning for you, says the Lord. I have good plans for you, not plans to hurt you. I'll give you a hope and I'll give you a good future. I don't know what problems you're facing today. I don't know what pain you're experiencing. I know the things I'm working through. And maybe for you, it's that you're out of work. Or maybe there's something going on at home that's just totally disconnected you from just hope. I want us to see together that God is working behind the scenes. And that together, this is where faith comes in that we need to trust him and we need to be patient. And then we come to the big question. The big, big question today is how do I trust God while I'm waiting? Well, again, there are three examples here that James gives us. He gives us the farmers and the prophets and Job. And so here's real quick, the three ways they responded. Like the farmers, I need to wait expectantly, that you're anticipating that the crops are gonna bear fruit. And so what is the farmer doing while he's waiting for the harvest? He's getting ready. He's not sitting around thinking, I wonder if this is going to grow or not. No, he's expecting it to grow. He's a farmer. So he starts getting ready for the harvest so that when it comes, he can bring it all in. In fact, the psalmist tells us, I wait expectantly, trusting God to help, for he's promised to help. That's Psalm 130, verse 5. So here's where it gets practical or maybe even a little meddling. What have you been waiting for God to do? Is it something in your marriage? Is it a financial problem? 
Is there a hurt that you have? Is there a loved one that you've got that you want to come to faith and be plugged into your church? Is there something going on in your family? Well, let me tell you this. Do we really expect God to show up? And if you really expect him to do it, what are you doing right now to get ready? What is it that's showing your expectation? Because we know this, we need to wait expectantly. And then while we're waiting, we need to be working and preparing. And what that does is it demonstrates our sense of expectation. Then like the prophets, that we need to wait without complaining, it says to us in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 26, it's good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord, that we're not supposed to complain because complaining is self-pity. And it's hard to be quiet when you're frustrated. And we're all frustrated right now with what's going on, I think, in so many ways. And often we don't mind waiting as long as we can complain about it, right? And so what James is teaching us here, right, is like the farmer, we wait expectantly. Like the prophet, we wait without complaining. And then finally, we wait confidently, like Job had confidence. And we know that Job does this well throughout his entire time in the storyline, that when God isn't talking, God hasn't explained to him why it's happening, why he's in so much pain. There's nothing more frustrating than chronic pain. And all this time, he's going through day after day, and the pain that he's experienced of losing everything, and yet he waited confidently. Job says, if a man dies, can he come back to life? It's interesting that the book of Job is probably the first book of the Bible ever written. Did you know that? It's kind of interesting. Uh, scholars aren't quite sure whether it's the first 11 chapters of Genesis or the book of Job, and there's reasons for that, and it's worth pursuing to see. And if you think about it, this oldest book, if you will, one of the things we know is that Job doesn't know that there's going to be a resurrection someday, that God's going to send someone to rescue humanity. He says again, if a man dies, can he come back to life? I will wait for better times, and I will wait till this time of trouble is ended. That's Job 14.14. 14. He says, I will wait when this time is ended. The time of trouble is ended. And when the outlook is bad, we need to look up. We need to look up. Now, I want to draw on just some wisdom from Pastor Rick Warren when he talks about having hope. And he says that as we spell the word H-O-P-E, that it's an acrostic again, as we looked last week, that it means holding on, praying expectantly. So I hope you can do that because we wait quietly and we wait expectantly and we wait confidently. Now, how do you express confidence in God? Well, it's simply this, by being still, that we show up and shut up. Just be still. In fact, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31 says, those who wait on the Lord will find new strength. They will fly high on wings like eagles and they'll run and not grow weary and they'll walk and they're not going to faint. So for all of us in this season, if we're tired, if we're drained, if we're just worn out, and you may need to recover as you're waiting for on God. What you're going to need to do is sit down with these notes and look at these verses again and go over it again and learn how it is that we're to be patient and to wait and learn the how and the why of waiting and to remind yourself of these ideas. So let me wrap all this up today by asking you, where do you need patience today? Is it some uncontrollable circumstance in your life? Is it a financial issue, or is it a long-term illness, or is it job responsibilities? Maybe you've had an unexplained problem pop up. Maybe you feel like you're walking the same journey that Job did and saying, why me? Why me, God? It doesn't seem to make any sense. What do you do in your situation? We need to remember those three wonderful truths, that God is in control and that we look to him, that nothing is beyond his power, and that his purpose for your life is greater than your problem, and God's still on the throne, and he knows what he's doing. And also to be reminded, finally, is that, that God will reward your patience, if not in this life, in eternity, for sure. And we need to remember that God is working behind the scenes, that this is not the end of the story, and so we need to be patient. And even when we can't see what he's doing, while we're waiting, he's working. While you're waiting, he's working. And so let's pray. Jesus, help us to wait expectantly, to prepare for the answer while I'm waiting on you. And help me to wait quietly, to not grumble or complain or take out my frustrations on the people closest to me. 
Help me to wait confidently to be still and not get anxious and not get worried and not get nervous. Help me to plant good seeds of patience and expect a harvest. God, we know that you're coming back someday. Father, give us encouragement in this moment through your Holy Spirit. Help us see you working in ways that will encourage us in our journey. Jesus, thank you for the life that has restored us. And Holy Spirit, seal us into all that you would have us do as we trust you for the outcome. And we thank you in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.